God has provided us a very beautiful day outside today uh, for us to all come in here and to praise and to worship and to be in the fellowship. Um, the topical study that I'm going to start in probably the next several weeks, and it's strongholds. And the, the strongholds that I'm talking about are the strongholds that, that Satan, evil spirits, devils, and demons use against us in our lives today and how that we can break these strongholds. Um, you know, I know growing up probably been in the ministry for over 20 something years and I didn't even myself as a minister start really learning about the spirits uh, until I was probably in my 30s. But it's very prevalent and we are in a spiritual battle for souls today. We are in a spiritual battle ourselves as individuals each and every day that we get out into the world because there's so much evilness in the world and so many bad spirits and the closer we get to the return of Christ the stronger and more prevalent those spirits are and you know even me and my wife growing up we were in the Baptist ministry and you never heard them teach about that I can say that because it's the truth I'm not bashing them but I never ever was taught anything about evil spirits and it is absolutely imperative that you understand that those do exist for how are you going to fight the enemy if you don't know who the enemy is. Right. Um, so under the title of Strongholds, there are several different topics that we will cover. We're not going to cover them all today. Uh, the one that I am going to do with you today is the spirit of fear. And that's a big one. And Satan loves to use that on us to hold us in fear. This sermon is a little bit different for me today because um, every sermon I've ever done since I've been standing behind the pulpit is I do the chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I'm normally in a chapter and I'll do half of it or all of it. But I am actually going to be jumping around today. But as long as a minister keeps the subject uh, in the context of the verse that I give you, it's okay to do it that way. So in order for me to uh, teach you about the spirit of fear, I will be jumping around to different verses. Um, I did not give all of those verses. Um, Randall, did you say them? I guess you did, didn't you? Yeah. Um, the verses that he gave you, I'm really not going to be there that long. So I will leave it up to you whether you want to try to flip back and forth or if you just want to jot these verses down and go back over them later when you get home. Be that as it may. So that's what we are going to do today is the spirit of fear. So uh, this verse that I quote leading this off and you're no stranger to because we quote it all the time is 2 Timothy 1.7 For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. We have the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? We don't have, we're not to have the spirit of fear. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of love uh, and of sound mind, folks. And, and that's, you know, that's what God gives us. But the enemy wants you to live in fear so that he can control you. Fear is a stronghold for Satan. It is a stronghold for Satan. Did you know that the phrase, do not fear, is actually in the Bible 365 days or times, which is one day. For every day of the year, God says, do not fear. So don't you think that might be prevalent to figure out what the spirit of fear is actually about, considering that God wants to remind you each and every day to be not afraid. Do not fear. I mean, what do we have to fear? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Absolutely nobody. But yet, we are held in bondage over fear sometimes of decisions that we've got to make or something that's going on in our lives or maybe it's a conversation that you're dreading having with somebody. Maybe it's you're going to talk to your boss about quitting your job. Whatever the case is, all the different kinds of scenarios that we go through in this life at times, the enemy holds us in fear. Why? I mean, they can't eat you. Right? I mean, so... Go ahead and nip it in the bud and hit it straight on and that's the way God would have you to do it instead of floundering and wandering around in fear of the enemy. 
So that's one time for every day. Alright, now there are two kinds of fears. We have a positive fear and we have a negative fear. So let's do a positive fear. Several different things that we could use for this. I'm going to quote this verse. Psalms 1, 11, 10. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. That is a positive fear because the word fear actually is revered in this verse taken back to the Hebrew language. So that is a positive fear. Why? Because when you love God, He's going to give you wisdom and common sense and protect you and bless you. So is that not a positive fear? The fear that we have for the Lord, which is actually to love God, not to fear Him. Um, another fear, I was hoping Blaine would be here today. I thought it might tickle him because I'm using him in the sermon today. But uh, he helped Dave on Dave and Christie's roof. Well, their house is way up off the ground. And so I did a devotional on this, uh, kind of on this spirit of fear. And he was saying, I said, we're not supposed to fear, Blaine. We're not supposed to fear. And he says, well, Brother Jimmy, he says, I'm standing up on that roof. And he said, I don't know whether to sit down or to stand up. And I said, that, I said, that is... I said, that is a positive fear. Is that not the common sense that God has given us? That when we are doing something and all of a sudden we are afraid, why are we afraid? Because it's the Holy Spirit of God telling you, hey, be careful. What you're doing could hurt you or cause your death. Amen. So that is a positive fear. Uh, that, that, that when the Holy Spirit, I can't think of women when they get off work late at night and they work in these big cities and crime and stuff so bad and everything so evil for them to have to walk out to their vehicle. Well, they're doing it broad daylight now. Walk out to their vehicles and have to worry about being mugged or raped or, or kidnapped or sold and trafficking. That is a positive fear. God saying, okay, it's dark out there. You need to watch what you're doing. You need to get somebody to walk with you. That is a positive fear because God gave us common sense and knowledge through His Holy Word. Alright, so negative fear is the negative faith of the devil. You may say that again. Negative fear is the negative faith of the devil. Is your faith today in God or is your faith in what the devil is telling you? Come on. You know, there's that whisper in your ear. And Satan, and, and I know it's so silly, you know, growing up, you, you watch this commercial and the devil's on one shoulder and the angel's on the other shoulder. And the devil's trying to say, I'll go ahead and do that. Ain't nobody going to care. Ain't nobody going to find out. Oh, it's going to be so great. Let's do it. And then the angel's on the other side. They said, oh, no, no. Don't do that. That's going to get you in trouble. That's the Holy Spirit talking to you. But the devil is always, tell me if I'm wrong, whispering in our ears every single day over every decision that we make or everything that we do or everything that you shouldn't be doing. The devil is always whispering in our ears. And we have to be fortified with the gospel armor of God in our, in our minds. And be prepared for that enemy each and every day. Now the verse I wanted to read for this, which is very powerful, talking about fear. This is Revelation 21, verse 8. And it says, But the fearful, which is what we're talking about, the spirit of fear, and the unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, and the whoremongers, and the sorcerers, idolaters and the liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone, and which is the second death. Do you realize that he put the fearful in with all of those really bad negative things? Amen. Now I'm not doing my job if I didn't teach you the deeper thread of that. This is at the return of Jesus Christ and those that were deceived by the Antichrist. And they've got much to fear because if they don't get it right that time, they are going to the lake of fire. But you still, He puts you in the same category when you are living in fear. <clears throat> we allow fear to reign in our life. And guess what? It is directly the opposite of what God tells us and promises us in His Holy Word. Can I get an amen? Amen. So let's talk about that negative fear a little bit more. What does negative fear do? It chokes out our faith. 
It, cho it chokes out our joy. It chokes out our peace and our love, and it binds and paralyzes us as Christians to soften us up. And guess what it does? It opens the door for other spirits of infirmities and bondage Amen. to come into your life. I mean, if you're afraid to step outside your door because the sky is going to fall, then you're being held in bondage, are you not? Because you are too scared to get out of your own house. Instead of trusting and having faith in God, Satan loves to use the spirit of fear on us. Medical science tells us that for it can cause many kinds of sickness. That's right. Do you know that you can talk yourself into infirmities? You can talk yourself into being sick? If you believe it long enough, you're going to be sick. And Satan loves that. So, fear also causes unbelief. Now, Jesus pointed out fear while they were battling the storm and it was a lack of faith. So therefore, I went to Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 through 27. I'll go ahead and read this and then elaborate. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 8. And when he was entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea. A tempest is a gale. You ever watch those movies on TV and there's this little old bitty ship out there and all of a sudden they're in this bad storm and I mean the biggest wave you've ever seen in your life, 20 foot tall coming up and you're thinking there ain't no way they're going to make it. So this was the type of the storm that was brought. It was a gale. Alright? Um, so they entered into the ship the disciples followed him and behold arose a great tempest to the sea insomuch that the ship was covered with waters but he was asleep. Christ was down in the hull of the boat and he was asleep. He wasn't worried about no storm. He's sleeping right through it. Alright, verse 25. And his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us. We may perish. Verse 26. What did he say to him? He said unto them, Why are ye fearful? There's our word again. O ye of little faith. How much faith do you have today in our Father? How much faith do you have? Then He arose and He rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm. And I do want to make a point to that. Jesus Christ rebuked that storm. Therefore, it was not of God. It wasn't of the Holy Spirit. It was sent by Satan. So it was the spirit of fear. Because obviously if Christ had called the storm, He wouldn't be rebuking Himself. He was rebuking Satan. Or the evil spirit of fear. Can I get an amen? Amen. <clears throat> Alright, let's do another one. How about the fear from the Garden of Eden? Let's go all the way back to the beginning. You don't have to turn there. I'm just quoting the verse. Everybody knows the story. They were given one commandment. They were in the garden of paradise that God had provided them. All they had to do was to keep it up, to till the ground, to take care of it. And He had one commandment. The first commandment in the Bible. One commandment. And they broke that commandment. And as a result of that, so the point is Genesis chapter 3 verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. Because God was calling out to them and they got scared and they hid. I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. There's your fear. Because I was naked and I hid myself. Is there a relationship between sin and fear? Yes. There's absolutely a relationship between fear and sin. Why? Because when you sin, then you are walking against the laws and the commandments of God. You are walking in disobedience. So therefore, you have something to fear. Because if you don't repent of that sin, it could throw you into hell. So there is a direct relationship between uh, sin and fear. The sinner has every right to be fearful. And we are all sinners, folks. Amen. All of us are sinners. But you know what? Christ paid an awesome price Amen. on that cross so that we could be forgiven of sins. Thank you, Jesus. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. hallelujah. Yes. Because you are walking in disobedience to God, then Satan will pick you off. Now, he loves it. 
Alright? In, in conjunction with fear, I'm going to read you some scripture from 1 John 4.18, which is some very good information for us to help ourselves to handle the fears that we face in our life today. 1 John 4.18 There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, folks? Because perfect love casteth out fear. If you love God and you are obedient in your walk with Him today, that perfect love that you have for Him will cause you to do what is right. It's not to say we're not going to fall short and that we're not going to mess up and we're not going to sin. But it's still up to you to repent of that sin. Amen. Because fear hath tormented. How many times have you been tormented by fear? I can think of many different situations in my life and things I shouldn't have been doing and just be gripped in fear. Have you ever had such a bad nightmare that, that you woke up that even though you had woke up, you're laying in the bed and you're moving your eyes around, you're looking around and you are paralyzed with fear. We have nothing to fear. For if God is with us, who can be against us? I'll say it again. Do not fear is mentioned 365 times in the Bible. That phrase. So I think it's pretty important that we understand the spirit of fear. Some of the major areas under the control of the spirit of fear. Phobias, nightmares, sickness, death, worry. God, worry is a big one. That's right. Even though we love the Lord and we know what His promises are, there's times in our lives when we just worry ourselves sick over something. And guess what? At the end of the day, God works it out for you because He loves you. And you're looking back and saying, why was I worrying? I'm not saying you don't have to do your part. Don't lay around on your butt and think God's going to do everything for you. But if you're going to sit there and worry yourself to give yourself a migraine and you worry yourself so much it makes you sick and you dread, and I mean, it's just terrible. You know what I'm talking about. And... When it's all said and done, like I said, you come to your senses and you realize, wait a minute, I've got God who is watching over, leading me, directing me, protecting me. And you sit there and say, oh my God, why was I so worried about that? Do you realize that that takes uh, years off of your, of your lifespan in this life to worry about stuff all the time? You ever been around somebody that worries about every little bitty thing? I mean, I couldn't imagine. I worry some anyway. But I couldn't imagine being worried about every single little thing that happens. Alright, Luke chapter 21, verse 26. <clears throat> Men's hearts failing them for fear. There we go with that word again, fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. When you are dominated by fear then you are a virtual prisoner of Satan. Now, that quote is from the Sermon of the Mount. And again, boy, they've got a real reason to fear in this end generation. Because guess what? The Antichrist is coming first, claiming to be Jesus. And then Jesus Christ, the true Christ, will return to this earth. And so that verse says, men's hearts are failing them for fear. Why? Because they realized that they were duped. That they were deceived. That they bowed a knee to the Antichrist instead of Jesus Christ. But God can deliver you from that fear. Now, not nobody's a stranger to the book of Job. Amen. You can turn there if you want to, but you do not have to. All right, Job chapter 3, verse 25. Actually, let me just turn there. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Job chapter 3, verse 25. And we know what all Job had gone through. But there's one thing, you know, a lot of times when we're studying God's Word, or we just read God's Word, 
until you really get into the Scriptures, sometimes we just overlook some things that are said. You're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And, and you know, the thing about God's Word is vast and it's ever learning and it's ever growing and it's ever moving. And there's so many different layers to it. And, you know, so it, it's, it's not hard to, oh, to read over something. But I myself had really not ever um, uh, realized this before until I studied this. So God uses the case of Job to show that God will allow Christians and people in general to suffer. Uh, sickness, loss of loved ones, uh, untold agonies. Uh, I had this scripture written down for this. It's Matthew 5, 45. I have people all the time uh, blaming God because they lost a loved one or this happened in their life and they're just blaming God for it. And this scripture says, For God maketh the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Folks, we're living life. Things happen. Accidents happen. It don't just happen to the ungodly. It also happens to the people that are good. But do you know what the difference is? The people that have a relationship with God, God is with them and gives you the strength to go through whatever it is that you are going through in your life. Amen. You look at what happened with Brenda and her mother and her family. God was with them. God was with her. God pulled her through this situation. We all lose people that we love. But guess what? We have the security of knowing by Almighty God and His promises in the Bible, we don't have to fear because our loved ones in heaven can I get an amen. amen. But the ungodly, they don't have that. Now could you imagine going through all the things you go through in your life and not have God with you in that time? We would fall to pieces. The spirit of fear wouldn't have to do nothing. We would crumble. But thank you, Lord, for being with us each and every step of the way. Okay, so, Job chapter 3, verse 25. Now I want you to listen to what he says in this verse. <clears throat> it says, this is Job speaking, For the thing which I greatly feared, there it is, there's our word, for the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. It just blows my mind. He was blessed beyond measure. I mean, he had all kinds of land. He had all kinds of wealth. He had children. He had livestock. And God's hand of protection was upon him. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, he's got all these good things in his life. And then you're actually going to be sitting about and worried about Oh, what if this happens to my kids? Oh, what if this happens to my, my wealth and my livestock and all those things? Why would you be thinking and living in fear off of something that may never happen? But we do, don't we? We start fearing the situation before the situation ever even happens and then we get into it and guess what? It wasn't that bad. And we worry ourselves sick. He brought this unto Himself. Because he was living in fear even when the times were good. That's right. I mean, I can understand, you know, you're rolling right along and all of a sudden the economy hits the skids and you lose your house, you lose everything you got but the clothes on your back. I can understand somebody being a little bit fearful where their next meal is coming from or where they're going to live or where they're going to stay. But this man had it all. And he was living in fear of losing it instead of being grateful uh, and thanking and blessing God for what for it. Why? For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. He was living in fear, and he had no reason to be living in fear. I had somebody uh, say to me uh, one time, they said that God uses us as, as, as part of a game to allow us to suffer. <clears throat> I said, no. <laughs> uh, you want to make a mistake in your life today, start blaming God for the bad things that happen in your life. I'll tell you right now, if people actually literally think that God's just, that we're just part of some kind of experiment and he lets us suffer as part of the game. Not be hate to be him judgment day. Because that is not true. Okay? 
But according to Job's own words, the problem that in that in part initiated the whole episode was he was living in fear of losing his children, losing his house, his livestock, and his wealth, instead of being grateful and thanking God for the blessings that he had gave him. And when we do that, we open the door to satanic oppression. You are fair game for Satan when you are living in fear today instead of living in the grace of God and walking in the light and letting Him guide your path today. By fearing the loss of His children, wealth, and health. This verse of Proverbs is so very true. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so he is. We do the same thing. We bring negativity to ourselves. We bring that negativity when we are living in fear of what's going to happen instead of living in peace knowing that God is with us. So, if you sit there and think today, well, I ain't never going to have another house nicer than this, and I ain't never, it's never going to happen, I ain't never going to amount to nothing. Guess what? You're not going to never amount to anything. So what you tell yourself, you will convince yourself eventually that it's going to happen. And it will happen. Is that not also a, a living in fear? I mean, I'd rather believe that I'm going to have nicer things. I, I would rather believe and know that I'm going to heaven instead of sitting back telling God what I ain't going to have. I'm going to tell God what I'd like to have. But I'm going to tell you right now, you better be praying for will, for God's will to be done in your life and not your will because He knows what's best for us better than we do. Amen. So He opened the door for Satan and Satan took vengeance. Up to that point, Satan had not been able to touch him because God had a hedge of protection around him. And He has a hedge of protection around you and your family. When you are walking in obedience to God. Amen. Now I'm sorry, you're not walking in obedience to God if you are living in fear. If you are not walking in the obedience of God and you are doing something wrong in your life today and you know it's wrong and you are willingly doing it each and every day, you do not have that hedge of protection. I can tell you for a fact, if He's got you on a path, He's giving you the direction of where you need to go and you start to get off that path, He will take His hands off of you and He will let Satan have his way with you until you get your stinking thinking right and get your butt back on the path that God would have you to be on. Amen. Because if not, the enemy's going to torment the fool out of you. Is that not what he did with Job? When Job finally got his stinking thinking in order, he got everything back tenfold of what he did lose. But if you continue to walk in disobedience to God, the spirit of fear is going to eat you alive. God did not stop. He did not stop it until Job got his thinking right. Is there a relationship between sin and fear? There absolutely is. We have something to fear when we are not doing what is right or if we are doing things that is disobedient to God. Are you walking in disobedience to God today? Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Everyone please bow your heads.